Hello, AP Macro students, and welcome to AP Daily. My name is Matt Romano. I'm coming to you from Marist School in Atlanta, Georgia. And today, we're going to look at some multiple choice questions from units one and two. We're going to throw it all the way back to the beginning here and, and make sure this stuff's making sense to us. There is a PDF attached that you can follow along with. If you want to do these questions, I would recommend you do that. Maybe pause every now and then, work out the question, come back and look at the answers. And without uh, any further ado, let's jump right on into this. Let's get started. Question number one. Brazil and Peru produce both coffee and wheat using labor as the only input. The table below shows the labor hours required to produce a unit of coffee and a unit of wheat in each country. Now, pause there for a second and let's think for a second. For all of these questions, you're gonna hear me say this throughout this and, and subsequent videos. Before we can move forward, we have to define what the problem is asking us. I had a, had a great professor in college said it all the time, a problem well-defined is half solved. So. Let's stop. Let's make sure we can figure out what we're looking at here, and, and then we can move forward and, and figure out the solution. So you've got two countries producing two goods, coffee and wheat. They gave us data regarding their production process. We don't know what the data means yet. We need to think about that and then get into what they could potentially ask us about that data. So first things first, the data. We need to know what are they asking me. This is going to either be an absolute or comparative advantage question. I can already tell that just because of the table they gave me and, and where it's going and the experience that we all have doing this type of work. So remind yourself, absolute advantage. Absolute advantage is all about who can produce more. Comparative advantage is who can produce at a lower opportunity cost. So there's a really good chance that we're gonna have to calculate that. And notice, I haven't put the answers up yet. We're gonna put those up in a second. I wanna think through what the possibilities are before I start to evaluate the possible response and solution. Before I can even consider absolute and comparative advantage, I've got to identify, am I dealing with input data or am I dealing with output data? And in this example, because they gave me a, a particular amount of time, labor hours to produce one unit, that tells me I'm dealing with what we often call an input problem. So I've got to think in terms of an input problem in order to evaluate the data I'm given. And then of course, determine the correct solution. So I'm going to do that first. Again, before I even look at A through E, I'm going to think through what the possible solution could be. If we're talking absolute advantage, which questions like this almost always ask about, if we're talking absolute advantage, when it comes to an input problem, it's really saying who can produce more, who can produce faster in terms of labor hours. So looking at coffee, if I look at coffee and it, say, it says it takes 12 hours in Brazil and six hours in Peru, absolute advantage must go to Peru. So I'm going to mark that here at my table just as a, a mental note to myself. Peru has absolute advantage. But when I switch over to wheat, both of them take four labor hours to produce a unit of wheat. And when that's the case, no one has absolute advantage. And that's perfectly acceptable in a question like this. Now move on to comparative advantage. Comparative advantage, as we said, that's going to exist when someone can produce at a lower opportunity cost. So this being an input problem with input data, it's actually, in my opinion, a little bit easier to determine what the opportunity cost is. For example, look at Brazil. It takes them 12 hours to produce one unit of coffee in Brazil. What could they have done in those 12 hours? Well, because it takes four hours to produce one unit of wheat, in those 12 hours, they could have produced three units of wheat. And by that same measurement, when you go down to Peru, it took six hours to produce a unit of coffee, took four hours to produce a unit of wheat. So in those six hours, they could have produced one and a half units of wheat. Now I just compare the two numbers. One and a half is less than three. Peru must have comparative advantage in the production of coffee. When I flip that over and I look at wheat, the Opportunity cost is simply going to be the reciprocal of the previous data that we just found. In four hours, Brazil can produce a third of a unit of coffee. In four hours, Peru can produce two-thirds of a unit of coffee. And because one-third is less than two-thirds, Brazil is going to have comparative advantage in the production of wheat. And now I'm ready to answer the question. I'm ready to look at the responses and determine what the correct answer is. And when I do that and flip through them, I'm going to find out pretty quickly. This is not correct. Peru has a comparative advantage in the production of wheat. That is not accurate. Peru has an absolute advantage in the production of wheat. No, no, they don't. That's not your answer. 
Part C, Brazil has an absolute advantage in the production of wheat. No, no one had an absolute advantage in production of wheat, so that can't be your correct answer. D, Peru has a comparative advantage in production of coffee. Well, when I look at my numbers and I look at my markings, yes, they do. That's the correct answer. But let's check D just in case, make sure it's not the right one. Brazil has a comparative advantage in producing coffee. No, no, they don't. So it's got to be D. The correct answer is going to be D. Take your time. Define the problem, then work your way through the options. Let's move on to number two. Okay, so here we have a PPC, a production possibilities curve. Like I said, we're going all the way back to unit one, and this was an early fundamental concept. Question says, the opportunity cost of moving production from point R to point T is. So let's evaluate where we are. We're at point R, we're on the curve. Resources are fully employed, and at point R, we're producing 10 units of good Y. We're, using, we're producing five units of good X. We're going to move along the curve. We're going to move to point T. And at point T, we're producing four units of good Y, 12 units of good X. And the question is saying, what is the opportunity cost of that change moving along? So we're moving along. Resources are being reallocated. As we move along, they're taking them away from good Y towards good X. They've acquired, they're producing seven more units of good X but they're giving up the production of six units of good Y, what's an opportunity cost? It's the highest valued foregone alternative to any decision made here. It's what they're giving up, those six units of good Y, those are the opportunity costs. So let's look at the options. Let's uh, identify our answer and select the right one. A, one unit of good Y. No, that's, that's not what we're gonna go with. B, five units of good Y. C, six units of good Y. D, three units of good X or E, seven units of good X. Well, in evaluating the model, we already found our answer. The answer is C, six units of good Y. Moving on, question number three. Which of the following changes would result in an indeterminate change in the equilibrium price in a competitive market? That word indeterminate, indeterminate change in equilibrium price. That is a big, big hint. Now. Let's go ahead, because it's a which of the following type question, let's go ahead and look at our, our potential responses, our potential answers. But there's a big hint with that word indeterminate. That tells me there has to be a double shift. We're not gonna have in a single shift situation, just demand, just supply, we're not gonna have an indeterminate variable. We're not gonna have an indeterminate price or quantity. So I already know at the start of this question, because I'm evaluating, I'm defining the question, this is a double shift. Any option that's not a double shift cannot be the correct answer. So A says an increase in demand, decrease in supply. B, an increase in demand and an increase in supply. C, a decrease in demand and an increase in supply. D, a decrease in demand with no change in supply. E, a decrease in supply with no change in demand. What stands out walking through those five options is that both D and E our single shifts, they cannot be the correct answer. We can go ahead and eliminate those right now and focus on A, B, and C. Now, to answer those, for me, the best way to do this is to have some scratch paper nearby, draw a graph, and figure it out. If it doesn't already come to mind, if you don't already know what the correct answer is, that's the beauty of economics. We have all these tools to help us answer problems. Draw the graph. So I'm going to draw a graph, just a generic graph of a market. And here we are in a competitive market. We're operating at equilibrium P and Q. I'm going to evaluate A first. What if we had an increase in demand and a decrease in supply, meaning demand shifts to the right, supply shifts to the left? Okay. I like using my arms too. I don't know if that works for you, but I like to use my arms to visualize this. And what I find is when they shift in opposite directions, no matter how much, no matter what the relative magnitude is, I know what's going to happen to price. In this case, for example, Increased demand, decrease in supply, price is going to go up. That's not my correct answer. And that recalls for me the other direction. If there's a decrease in demand and increase in supply, the same thing's going to happen. Price is going to fall. I know what's going to happen to price. C cannot be my answer. My answer must be option B, an increase in demand and increase in supply. And I can use my graph just to confirm that. Now, what this shows me, obviously the way I drew it, price didn't change, but is that absolutely the way it's gonna work? No. If demand had shifted a little bit further to the right, we would have seen price go up. 
if supply had shifted a little bit further to the right, price would have gone down. The way B is phrased, it's correct. We don't know the relative magnitude of these two shifts, so we can't say what's going to happen to equilibrium price. Equilibrium price is indeterminate in this example. So your answer is B. Question four. Now we're talking from unit two. We're going to talk about macro data. Table below shows a country's macroeconomic data in 2013. The country's GDP is? Well, here you have these different categories. I want to put this into a context that we can use and break down so that we can do a calculation and figure out what it is. So we're really saying here, we're, we're using the expenditures approach to GDP. The expenditures approach to GDP, which is adding up consumer spending, investment spending, government spending, and net export spending. There's nothing on here from the income approach. We can't worry about that. That's a whole separate issue. All I need to do now is recall those four categories and then go through the table, see which ones apply and by how much, add them up, and I'll have my answer. Again, do this before you even look at the options. Know what your answer is going to be because it's clear what they're asking you. So working my way down the table. Consumption spending, yeah, that's C. That's the C in CIGNX. That $175 billion, that counts. Individual income taxes, no, there's no component here that includes individual income taxes. We're not going to count that $32 billion. Private investment spending, of course. Private investment spending counts. That's $30 billion. We're going to include that in our calculation. Corporate taxes, no, not included. Exports, $75 billion in exports, yes, of course. That's a component of net exports. That's going to add to GDP, so we want to include that. Government purchases, $40 billion. Yes, we're going to add that as well. And then imports, $100 billion. Does it count? Yes. However, as we know, that's the negative part of the net exports. We're going to subtract that $100 billion in import from net exports, leaving us with 175 plus 30 plus 40 plus 75 minus 100. And as you pull up your options, we're going to find that A, $222 billion is going to be the correct option when I add those four together. B, 282, obviously too high and included too much. C, 304 billion, again, too high. D, 309 billion, too high. And E, 347 billion, way too high. It's including way too many things. Question five, if unemployed workers become discouraged and give up trying to find work, the number of workers employed and the unemployment rate would change in which of the following ways? Now we have two options. Now, one of the things I like to do in a, in a, in a two column question like this is simply go one column at a time. Read through the first column and see if you can eliminate anything and, and narrow it down before moving on to the second column. And in this particular question, conveniently enough, you can do that. You had unemployed workers who become discouraged. They're giving up looking for work. So you had unemployed workers who are leaving the labor force. This doesn't do anything to the number of workers that are employed. There was nothing stated here about the people that are employed. So for all we know, ceteris paribus applies, for all we know, there's been no change in the number of workers employed. So option A, number of workers employed decrease, unemployment rate decrease. Because we're talking discouraged workers here leaving the labor force, we're not talking about employed workers. This one doesn't affect employed workers. Option B, decrease number of workers employed, increase unemployment rate. Again, number of workers employed hasn't changed. Option C, decrease in number of workers, no change in unemployment rate, cannot be the correct answer. Already, I'm down to a 50-50 because I've just evaluated that first left-hand column. The answer is going to be D or E. Now we've got to figure out unemployment rate. What's going to happen there? It's either going to increase or decrease. Consider your formula. The unemployment rate is simply the number of unemployed workers divided by the labor force. Both of these have decreased. And as a result, the unemployment rate is going to decrease. You have unemployed workers leaving the labor force. The unemployment rate is going to decrease. Okay, that's going to do it for this first video. Thank you so much for taking some time out to watch it with me. I hope that it helped you out, and I hope you come back for subsequent AP Daily videos. And as always, with all these videos and all the questions you do, remember, problem well defined is half solved. Thanks.